If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Sandra Gowdy's back on the show, and she's not one to hide how she feels about any topic. This week, we're going to talk about the plotting going on inside the Waitangi Tribunal, who are seeking to expand their powers. Sandra's on the line and joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Sandra. It was great having you last time, and it's going to be fantastic having you this time. Awesome. Thank you, Cam. Now, you're a bit exercised about the shenanigans going on in the Waitangi Tribunal, and in particular, an article that Michael Bassett wrote entitled uh, Maori Push for Parallel Government Structures. This is not well known, is it? Not really. What got me exercised way back at the beginning was, for, for some reason, I picked up the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975 and read it. And I was absolutely gobsmacked by what was in that legislation. And historical claims, treaty claims, are entered into in 2015. It's signed by Isaacs, and then there's another memorandum from the tribunal signed by Fox. And it actually says they're going to start a raft of inquiries, constitutional inquiries. And that was back in 2015. So most people aren't aware of that. And they all relate to government department activities because the treat the Treaty of Waitangi Act allows the tribunal to make inquiries and make claims against any action of the government. Forever. Well, um, unless the legislation, the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975, has changed and the conditions around the Waitangi Tribunal are changed, yes, it goes on ad infinitum. So let's just get this straight. This constitutional review that the Waitangi Tribunal has undertaken began in 2015. That's when John Key was the Prime Minister and then handed over to Bill English. I wonder if they're aware of these extrajudicial reviews that the Waitangi Tribunal is trying to do, you know, constitutional reviews of, of how we're governed. Well, I don't know that they would because these are put out in memorandums by the Waitangi Tribunal and I'm not sure what the level of oversight of the Waitangi Tribunal is by government as it goes about scrutinising its business and the level of scrutiny it gives. So I don't know whether they delve into the memorandums that come out. And this memorandum referred to the, in my memorandum of 1st of April 2015, I indicated I would comprise 11 inquiries and set out the order in which they would commence Included in that program was an inquiry into claims concerning the constitution, self-government, and the electoral system. So that all happened. That all that was all referred to in a, a memorandum of 2015. That's how long ago it was. The level of understanding outside of the Waitangi Tribunal, I don't know. Is the, I think the level of understanding in the general public about the Waitangi Tribunal is scant, and it would appear that the Court of Appeal has an equally scant. Uh, opinion about what the Waitangi Tribunal is supposed to be and have unilaterally almost elevated them to the status of being a court, which they are not. No, because their only, their only authority is to look into claims and they can only make recommendations to the government. They have no power to do anything else other than to make recommendations. Now, I'm only speaking as a layperson, but one of the other provisions within the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975, which does give some cause for alarm, is that within the realms of the tribunal, they can interpret the principles of the treaty how they so wish. And that's leading to these judgments, if we can call them that, from the Waitangi Tribunal that start talking about things that don't exist, like a partnership. Uh, an equal partnership in the treaty, rather than what the treaty actually says, which is ceding sovereignty to the Crown. But again, they only have the ability to make recommendations to the government. They can't make judgments and statements. It's recommendations only to the government, as far as my understanding goes. They develop PO, which are project 
operational units. They call them PO, P O U. Mm. And they do the groundwork for what they propose to put forward to the government. But again, these seems like papers of fait accompli rather than recommendations to the government, which they can either accept or, or, or refute. It seems like they're, they're creating a make work scheme for themselves. And uh, one of the flows of work in this make work scheme seems to be drafting a new constitution or indeed a constitution because New Zealand doesn't actually have a constitution. Well, the problem with it is that, that someone, one of the governments, changed the act to allow them to do that because the historical claims were coming to a close, so they had no work in front of them. They had to create a reason for continuing to exist. And so, therefore, the amendment to the Act gave that opportunity to them. And so the the government has made a huge error in, in how they amended the Act to enable the plethora of claims that can now be made. They can make a claim on the fact that their cowpapa was not included in nurses' training, things like that. I mean, it's completely open to whatever they want to make a claim against in terms of their kaupapa. And then, of course, it's only for Māori. It's not, it's denied to everybody else. And I, I just think that people forget that we're all a part of this treaty and that goes, it's in line with the Queen Victoria's Royal Charter, which preceded the treaty and is the, really the basis on which the treaty sits. But who made this amendment? Which government made that amendment? Well, this particular amendment I haven't explored more closely. All I know is that there's about 12 amendments that have been made to the Act over time and predominantly all by Labour, bar one from National. The actual wording in regard to the contemporary claims they're called, the Cowpapa Inquiry, I'd have to explore that and find out for, for sure who actually made that amendment. But what's done is done. The key thing is we have this piece of legislation now it's going to be challenging to see if the current coalition government can rise to that challenge, and it will be a challenge, to amend the legislation so that it becomes sensible. I think one of the ways to actually curb it is to allow the same playing field for the rest of New Zealanders. I mean, I'd like to take a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal on the basis of prejudicial bias in favour of a minority against the majority. Theoretically, you could, because uh, the Waitangi Tribunal is set up to explore grievances under the treaty, and there's new grievances that are being now created by these rapacious settlements that are going on, and then enacting of legislation which creates further grievances where we've got a race-based system happening in, for, for example, health or something like that. That's right. So... I can't take a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal because only a Māori are allowed to. Well, that's something that needs to be either amend it or remove it completely. Well, that's what I'm saying. So that, yeah. that's where the challenge for government comes, for the, this current coalition government. So I don't I'm, think Christopher Luxon's got the stones to do anything with that, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Shane Jones and Winston Peters do. Uh, I, I have no doubt, and uh, ACT as well. And so it's just... I don't know that the National Party has been challenged on it yet enough to see where they would go on this because I think they have to do something. It's getting somewhat out of hand. I mean, yesterday I went to a hearing with the regional council and they're wanting to put up the rates on properties over 20 hectares. So that's penalising those particular properties unduly and that's for having lots of areas of bush and things like that partially. And yet, under the remissions, Māori can claim for those same areas of bush for remissions and their rates. Well, that doesn't seem... But no one else can. Yeah, so it's not a level playing field, is it? Well, totally not. And everybody else is paying for it. So it's constant ties, and it's hidden. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, uh, Michael Bassett's onto something here. You know, the, and, and there's no person smarter in New Zealand politics than Michael Bassett. He's suggesting that there is is, in fact, a move afoot by the radical Maori fringe of New Zealand society to create a parallel system of government, parallel to, to our elections, where iwi have power over everybody else. Yep. 
but it's already being driven in legislation like the um, Whakahono Rohi agreements within the RMA. The types of preference that Māori have within legislation, those things are already being driven so that there's an obligation there. I mean, the, one of the things that Sir Michael Bassett referred to was Professor Sir Hugh Kavaru yes. from Ngāti Whātua. And, you know, huge respect for Sir Hugh. And I was on the Haraki Golf Forum and delighted when Moana Samareki Poi was elected chair in her own right, no co chair as head of that forum. Sadly, though, she didn't have, as I understood it, the um, full support of the appointed iwi and uh, made life very difficult. So I was sorry to see her have to step down. Are we perhaps seeing this fuss that was made over summonsing uh, Karen Chaw, the children's minister, to the Waitangi Tribunal as a tactic to have the government reject that, which they did. They won in the High Court that said, no, you're not a court, you can't do that, you only have limited powers to summon people. Then that allowed the uh, Waitangi Tribunal to appeal that, and then you get the activist judges who say, well, actually, yes, you can be summonsed to the Waitangi Tribunal, but um, whoopsie, we're a bit late on this one because the legislation's already been put before the House but it's just a tactic to get the Court of Appeal to say that, yes, they can be, so that now the Waitangi Tribunal can dream up any summons they like and drag in government ministers to harangue them, essentially by the majority of the 20 representatives on the Waitangi Tribunal are part of that radical Maori fringe that magically believe that sovereignty was never ceded. Well, I think it raises a couple of interesting points. First, it sounds like the High Court is smarter than the Appeal Court, and certainly certainly it sounds like they've actually read the legislation. Um, Secondly, I think it's starting to be recognised that the Waitangi Tribunal has become radicalised. And thirdly, the ability for them to summon someone in regard to legislation, whether the legislation has been drafted or not, I don't think that the Treaty of Waitangi Act gives them the power to do that. So certainly they can summon people to the tribunal for other matters, I would have thought, but not for legislation. And so that's where I think the High Court got it right and the Appeal Court got it wrong. But as I say, I'm only a lay person who's had had a, um, a good reading of the legislation, so what would I know? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I just think it's uh, crazy. I think that um, I was delighted that the legislation was introduced into the House, which cuckolded the Waitangi Tribunal attack. But I think that sends a signal to the government that they have to act. They have to change the Treaty of Waitangi Act, the 1975 legislation. They have to do that. And I think Michael Bassett's onto something here when he, he says that, that there is a move to get rid of the word quasi judicial and to give the Waitangi Tribunal the full powers of a court, despite the fact there is very few members of the tribunal that have any legal skills at all. Um, Only one, the judge, I understand, who's in charge, Karen Fox, has any sort of legal skills in the Waitangi Tribunal. The rest are uh, a bunch of radical Maori fringe drillers that have got this heroic view uh, that the treaty is something that says is something that it does not. But this is the type of thing that Labour has done consistently, particularly Mm. over their last term of government. And one of the most glaring examples, but only glaring to people like myself who are a bit, um, sort of dig into some areas, the public have no idea. But the legislative guidelines, which, and they have a legislative committee, which is appointed by the government, and there's not enough scrutiny of that. And they change the legislative guidelines to such a degree that I think, again, that's what another area that the government has to look at and give some serious scrutiny to because the law must be clear and it must be equitable. Uh, and I think that we need to have another look at the how the rule of law is constructed. It's the construction of the law that's as important as what you start to put into it because if the legislative guidelines aren't robust, and you're being led down the garden path within them, then your law is not going to be robust either. And that's absolutely critical. 
I think the Labour Party, uh, you have to admire them really for their rat cunning, their low rat cunning, because I've been saying for years that the problem with the National Party is that they're the party of the status quo, that they very rarely do any sort of reforms or repeal anything. They uh, just like to manage what they've inherited from the previous Labour government and then do nothing. And so Labour, by doing these legislative changes and allowing these heroic assumptions about what the treaty says and its interpretation, have allowed that to become uh, the urban legend to become reality because the, most people think that it's, that's what this is because of the language that's used by the politicians, et cetera, that this is a partnership. And they knew that the National Party would do nothing about it. And that's what we're seeing, that the National Party is sitting there like stunned mullets watching what's going on. Uh, and it seems to be only ACT and New Zealand First, but in particular Winston Peters and Shane Jones and David Seymour, who have spoken out against the Waitangi Tribunal, notably all three are Maori. Probably not the right kind of Maori that the Waitangi Tribunal would believe, but they're Maori nonetheless, have spoken out about this. And so we may actually see some action if ACT and New Zealand First squeeze the nuts of Christopher Luxon. Well, um, Christopher Luxon, but the the responsibility actually all falls within the purview of the Attorney General. So, as I understand it, so I think there has so to be Judith some Collins. yes, and I mm. think there has to be some concerted effort. If this last um, action by the Waitangi Tribunal, which pulled in the the appeal court, doesn't give national pause that, that they have to take some action, they have to be prepared to buy that fight and be prepared for the hikoi's and, and the like, because I don't see that we're going to see anything else but a concerted campaign to bully the government into submission by the vociferous actions of a minority. I mean, we, we're seeing these Maori radicals in the universities, on the Waitangi Tribunal, also in Parliament in the Maori Party, who absolutely, despite all the evidence uh, that's gone before us from Nata, from uh, Sir Hugh Kaurau, uh, they refuse to concede that Maori ceded sovereignty to the Crown. And, and the Maori Party comes in and says, no, we didn't. They, they absolutely are adamant that Maori never ceded sovereignty to the Crown, despite the fact that the translation says the chiefs of the Confederation give absolutely to the Queen of England forever the complete government over their land. Oh, well, does that make <laughs> their treaty claims null and void then? Well, that's 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 the issue, isn't it? Oh, if you've okay. got so we someone might who well, changes we might well the definition. Their treaty claims. Yeah, if, ask if, if for they, it all back. Yeah, like if they can start all over again with the musket if they want. But actually, no, I take that back. <laughs> that's getting a little bit crazy. But it does beg the question, well, if you didn't, then why did you enter into a treaty claim process? I mean, basically what they've done, and again, you have to admire the cunning of it, right? Well, they've, no, it's sort of dumb cunning because here they're on the one hand saying they, they never ceded sovereignty and yet they signed into a treaty claim. Yes, but the woke white people will all sit there and go, oh, yes, poor hard done by Mary. I better shut up about this because I'll be called racist, uh, even though we're debating facts that are written down facts nonetheless. Uh, but they've contrived this confusion around what Article 1 of the treaty really says and means. And, and let's not begin Article 3. Yeah, and then use that confusion to claim that sovereignty still rests with Maori. So they're now pushing that parallel system of government, which if you look at everywhere else in the world where a parallel system of government has ever been implemented, it ends in tears at best or violence at worst. But it comes back to what I said to you before. The Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975 gives them the ability to interpret the treaty principles in any way they like because it's meant to be constrained by the fact that they can only give recommendations to government. But they've taken it a step further. They are actually pushing these things as absolutes, not recommendations. And so that's the concern that you raised earlier. Uh, and so that's what they've got to do something about in terms of the legislation. They have to change 
the legislation. I'm not interested if they want to claim they didn't cede sovereignty and all that garbage because they're saying that on the one hand and taking it on the other. I mean, you know, come on. It's just a joke. Well, the thing is, is Article 2 and 3 guarantee Maori equality with everyone else in New Zealand. That's right. And so now every time I see a prejudicial bias in favour of a minority, which is becoming much more um, consistent from the government in terms of its legislation, uh, I now call that a breach of the treaty because I'm a part of that treaty in Article 3 that we're all meant to be equal under the law. So whenever the government identifies a prejudice or creates a prejudicial bias in favour of a minority, it's a breach of the treaty in regard to the rest of New Zealand citizens. But you can't do anything about that breach. No, I because can't because, because I'm not, not Maori, Maori and I can't take a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal. Besides, with the radicalised Maori there right now, would I want to? Well, hang on a second. There's a, there might be a little escape clause for us all. Uh, you know, we can use the transgender debate and and say that we feel Maori and therefore we are Maori and we we might not uh, be affiliated with a traditional iwi, but our iwi is Ngāti Pākehā. So now we're going to take a claim to the tribunal because we feel Maori and are Maori, just the same way that a bloke can put a frock on and say that he's a woman. Well, it has been said that you could potentially do that because some legislation sort of uh, makes it a bit ambiguous. But it's a bit like the word tikanga and the word matauranga. So they talk about uh, tikanga Māori. Well, mm. actually, you can talk about tikanga Pākehā. You can talk about matauranga Māori and matauranga Pākehā. Matauranga is essentially just knowledge. Tikanga is just your behaviours, essentially. But every iwi and every hapu and every grouping of people has different tikanga. So but you know, that's you, right. you've, you've got the law uh, schools now saying there will now be compulsory tikanga courses. Well, who's kitanga are we going to? Uh, uh, but they usually say tikanga Māori, and that's why they want tikanga Māori and tikanga uh, matauranga Māori written into legislation, every piece of legislation. And so, and and having councils um, have to adhere to tikanga Māori and matauranga Māori within some of their obligations. It's crazy because... I, it's totally crazy. I mean, I, I, I can only see one possible solution, which I'm not sure that Christopher Luxon has got the stones to grasp the nettle on, but the only possible solution to this is abolish the, the Waitangi Tribunal. It was set up in 1975... Mm. Uh, when there were very few Maori in Parliament. It was intended to safeguard their interests, guarantee their voice, and deal with treaty claims. There's only one claim outstanding now. That's Napui. And they should just abolish the Waitangi Tribunal. We know have established what's happening in Napui, create special legislation just for Napui, get that settled. That's it. See you later. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Here's your final check. And um, see you later. Oh, by the way, we, we've already leased the um, building and the offices to somebody else. Uh, you can move out at the end of the month. Well, you've got the Maori Land Court. You've got Tapuna Kōkiri. You've ne now got um, the other one that escapes me from uh, Afita. Uh, I've forgotten the other one that was created under Labour in 2021, a whole new government department to uh, simply to advise the Attorney General and the work that they're doing is alarming, to say the least, and it needs a lot more scrutiny, but it's, a, it's another bigger story to some degree. Um, one of, on, a, on a whole different topic, um, but certainly related to these issues, I was wondering in the debate around media funding, where the funding for Māori media was coming into it, and I, I never saw a breakdown of any of the figures of all the media that's funded by the government. Oh, there's... You know, numerous ones, but uh, in terms of Maori media, you've got the radio, you know, Radio Watia that's funded by the government. Uh, that's Willie Jackson's little private vehicle. John Tamahiri is involved with that as well. Uh, you've got uh, Maori Television, which I'm not sure anybody watches it, but we fund that uh, to the tune of millions of dollars a year, and no one's hearing anything about Maori Television uh, losing any revenue and going down the gurgler. 
So they must be sitting there like Radio New Zealand in a state-funded bliss and that's, laughing, that's, laughing like hell. That, that's the thing that I found missing was basically a spreadsheet of all the media funding provided by the government. And so a spreadsheet so everybody could see exactly how much the government was contributing where and have a much more informed decision and discussion around continued media funding and what level that might be, you know, in spite of the TVNZ and TV3 scenario, I think there need to be a whole, a much more holistic, encompassing discussion around it myself. We're starting to see some information come out, particularly around advertising revenues. Philip Crump, or otherwise known as Thomas Cranmer on X, a formerly Twitter, uh, he's produced some documents on how much some of the COVID advertising that was spent by one agency, just one agency, tens of millions of dollars. Most of that went into radio and television ads and, of course, social media. But uh, I, I've said this to government ministers before. I said, you need to get the heads of department and tell them to come to a, a, a meeting with the minister, uh, the state services minister or whoever it is, come to a meeting armed with all of the facts about your media spend for the last six years and your projected media spend for the next six years. And I want all of those facts and figures, present all of those, and, and we'll see just that how many tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars across all government departments uh, has been spent on inane advertising. A, a classic example is the ad that's on the radio for people to look again at intersections so they can see motorcyclists. Look again, look again, just nags you on the, on the radio. The endless advertisements for our oh, COVID still lurking out there, better get another jab. Uh, the endless advertisements for the flu jab, for uh, the measles jab, for everything. There's just endless advertising from government departments. And then say, well, right as of right now, there's a moratorium on any spending for any government advertising, any government department. And there's a committee that we've set up here. And if there's something that's urgent, like we've got you know, an outbreak of something we need to advertise for, then just take it to the committee and they'll approve it. But in the meantime, there's no spending for six months while we get a handle on this. And then give it to someone like Bill English, who loves spreadsheets, and cut the hell out of it. And then see and, what and happens that's in the media and, and see what happens in the media environment when they no longer have the government teat to suck off. Think about the savings that the government would make on that alone. But and I just wonder how much they're aware of that's actually been allocated to those areas within each of the ministries. And in line with that, one thing I'd love to see is that if adjectives are taken out of any media release so that it becomes more factual data and that any statement made by the media, there has to be a reference available to some empirical data to prove that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be another good. I mean, have you ever been to the doctor's surgery and sat there waiting? Because you always wait; they're never on time, right? Um, you're sitting there in the doctor's surgery, and the walls are covered with literally hectares of printed material about breast scanning, or mumps, or measles, or rubella, or anything. There's just posters everywhere. You just sit there thinking. You dare not look at it because it just depresses you on all of these illnesses. But that's what the health department, the Ministry of Health, does. They send all of these out to all these medical practices and they stick them all up all over the place. There's pamphlets, there's little – who picks up a pamphlet? I've never seen anyone well, actually, it, it may pick come up a from pamphlet. The, maybe come, come from the pharmaceutical company that's promoting the product to save you from these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could be, but but you know, you you get my point. I've never seen anybody go. Mm. Yeah, you go to to lab tests or whoever, oh, whatever they call. <laughs> you go, oh, look at that! It's it's you know, it's like when you go and stay in a motel, right? If people still do that these days, stay in a motel and at the check in place, there's all of these these racks of all these brochures of things you can do, and almost no one ever takes them. And so yeah, that's the same with in the lab tests and doctors' rooms. There's all of these brochures, and you never see in you know Mrs. Miggins get up on her walker and trottle over there and sort of rest and reach up and grab a, a little brochure and go, oh yes, I yes I must get my smear test. Yeah, you know, they don't do it. 
So why are we producing all of this stuff? Cam, I wouldn't want to exercise myself on that. But the one thing I would love <laughs> to see you do is find a way to actually exhort the government in writing to do that spreadsheet of the the advertising and media spend. It'd be interesting to do it via an OIA, but I suspect they'd reply, oh, no, it's commercial, commercially sensitive. We can't give you an answer. In which well, case, no, a, minister, a question to the minister would be the way to do it. Get, get that some, means you've got to write to how many ministers? Well, no, you just get a, an MP to ask the question. You know, backbench MP who's doing nothing. What, to ask the question in the House? Well, no, not necessarily in the House, a written question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Right, because then you'll get an answer, because they have to answer you, answer you in a written question from one MP to a, to a minister. They oh, have yeah, to so answer. You've, you've answered my question, so yeah. so it looks like New Zealand First is a good, uh, good avenue for that, a good vehicle for doing <laughs> Yeah, New Zealand First or, or an ACT MP, right. they've, they've yeah. got a few more spare, you know, that aren't doing too much. Get them the task of... of finding out what the advertising spend is for every government department. It would be eye-watering sums. Uh, uh, but I, I don't want just the advertising spend. I want the media spend as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. No, thank you for that. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> you do I, that. I'm a doer. I like to do shit. <laughs> there we go. You you organise that. I and, will. Uh, and then when you get all the answers, we'll have another interview um, discussing <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit passe now, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I I, just, I think walloping. This is the thing, right, with with government ministers, and I have to educate a lot of people about what goes on in Parliament. Um, you know, <laughs> I know a couple of people that had had been down to present oh, a petition, <laughs> and yeah, and and they and they uh, they then went and watched Parliament, and they they said they couldn't believe looking down from the gallery above, watching MPs playing Candy Crush, reading. Uh, you know, websites, all while Parliament's in progress. And, and I said, well, you've got to understand something here. It's, it's all for show. It's not reality what you actually see. And anyone who goes down to Parliament as an MP thinking they're going to change the world just gets ground underfoot by the system. The system never changes because we don't do what they do in America. When the government changes, when we get a new president in the United States, all of the heads of departments, all of the um, almost all of the uh, cushy ambassadors' jobs are they're instantaneously wiped out, gone, see you later, and new ones are appointed. And we don't do that. And so you get a new government in and you'll get a press secretary who is working for James Shaw is now working for the same job uh, for the new minister in a new government. And it's ludicrous that they actually keep these people on, but that's the system. And so if you go down there wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, you're going to change the world as an MP. The system doesn't let you. <laughs> Just... um, it, can, it can do. I, I Look, in the main, but I don't agree entirely. I actually think there are opportunities, and I think people do make a difference. But it does remind me of, of uh, Michael Cullen and the Fiscal Responsibility Act. I felt that with, with Labor's such shocking handling of our money, New Zealand's money, that we should have been taking them to court under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But that's, anyway. again, a classic example of the system working for the benefit of those in the system. So, oh, yeah. you know, Ruth, Ruth Richardson passed that law, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, because of the the that's absolute right. appalling state that the books were in in 1990. And National stupidly goes along with it and plays by the rules. Labor never does. They don't care. You had Michael Cullen, then you had Grant Robertson, the Minister of Printing Money, and he's buggered off and got a job that pays more than the Prime Minister on the basis that he was used to be the Finance Minister who spent money like a drunken sailor. That's right. And there is no responsibility. There's no penalties under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. There's no willingness of anybody to enter into a prosecution no new government is going to prosecute the old government because they'll be worried that it'll be tit for tat when they get bundled out of office. And then uh, you end up with a situation like you've got in the United States where Democrats are keeping Donald Trump in court on spurious grounds simply because he's Donald Trump. And they run the risk now that when Trump wins the next election, that he turns around and does the same to them. 
Well, someone said that that he's in jail, he wins the election, becomes the president, he immediately pardons himself. <laughs> oh. I thought that was quite funny. But look, you're, you're right about the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Um, and so, therefore, they should try and find some mechanism which potentially can cuckold the, a, a change of government to such a degree that they are forced to behave more responsibly. But anyway, that, that's, those are bigger debates. No, so, what you need is penalties to say that if you breach the Fiscal Responsibility Act, then uh, you uh, are removed from being an MP forever. And that way there is some consequences, some real-world consequences for being a moron with the country's books. I mean, we, we look at Mille in, in Argentina. He passed a law in his first 100 days that says if, the, if anyone in the Reserve Bank wants to print money, they go to jail. So therefore, as along with that, I like that idea about preventing them from being Member of Parliament ad infinitum, but uh, also maybe an independent commission of some sort which has oversight of their books and their fiscal um, decisions. But anyway, I think you're probably just about done with me then. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> we are up against time, uh, Sandra. <laughs> As usual, we've had an absolute ball solving the, the ills of the world, and uh, you're welcome anytime back on the show. Uh, so thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. All right. Thank you. The Waitangi Tribunal seems to be pushing the barrow of a few rowdy ratbag activists who are trying to shoehorn our democracy into a co-governance envelope, effectively conducting a constitutional coup. It's great that we have people like Sandra Gowdy who highlight issues like this. Tell me your thoughts on what Sandra had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.